I want to begin uh, reading some statistics pertaining to the use of alcohol in America. These are about two or three years old, so I'm sure they're quite accurate. Alcohol addiction is the most common type of substance use disorder in the United States. Substance use disorder is the medical term for addiction. And alcohol use disorder is the medical term for alcoholism. The latter condition, alcoholism, affects about 5% of Americans each year. Now, there's a lot more here, but I'll just read more of uh, the statistical material. This all comes from the National Survey on Drug Uses and Health. 15.1 million Americans, Americans age 12, ages 12 and older had an alcohol use disorder in 2016. 488,000 youths between the ages 12 and 17 had an alcohol use disorder in 2016. 2.3 million people ages 12 and older received treatment for an alcohol use disorder in 2016. 1.1 million people ages 12 and older received treatment for both alcoholism and an illicit drug use disorder in 2016. 2.1 million people across the world were members of the Alcoholics Anonymous support group in 2016. That's according to AA's General Service Office. Concerning long-term health problems caused by alcohol and liver disease, heart problems, cancer, et cetera. About 88,000 deaths per year are caused by alcohol per a 2014 Centers for Disease Control and Prevention study. 10,497 people died in alcohol-impaired driving crashes in 2016, according to a National Highway Traffic Safety Administration report published in October of 2017. That's again 10,497. About 19,500 or 3.5% of all cancer deaths in the United States were related to alcohol in 2009, according to a 2013 study published in the American Journal of Public Health. 38.1% of people killed by homicide or law enforcement in 2013 tested positive for alcohol according to data from the National Violent Death Reporting System. 38.2% of people who died by suicide in 2013 tested positive for alcohol, according to data from the National Violent Death Reporting System. Alcohol is one of the most widely available and easily, easily accessible addictive substances. When consumed responsibly, the risks are benign. Uh, I would simply say, how do you know what is consuming responsibly? However, people are often unable to, unwilling to drink responsibly again. How do you determine that? So I wanted to mention these things. At the same time, I wanted you to notice that they still try to regulate it by these last two comments, drinking responsibly. You don't know what that is. No one knows for sure what that is. And no one can ever be an alcoholic if they never take the first drink. No one will ever abuse it if they never take the first drink. The very nature of what alcohol does to a person and how it does it is deceptive. It slips up on them and it begins with the first drink and however much alcohol is in that drink. So, as I've said many times, and I've had some get upset with saying that, when you take one drink, you're one drink drunk. You take two drinks, you're two drink drunk. 
and on you can go until you fall down, passed out, drunk. And some have even, as you realize, that these binge parties and beginning of college year, and it won't surprise me at all, the next few weeks we'll hear some of this, they guzzle it down so fast, so much alcohol gets in their system, the body can't get rid of it, and somebody dies. We don't ever learn on things like this. People want to have their fun and try to figure out ways to get around all of it. But I don't see if these statistics are anywhere near right, and in view of your own observation, probably even in your own family and friends and neighbors and people you work with, that you can see that these things are completely out the window. I grew up, and the lady and her husband that operated a small country store would go on about two binges every year. They didn't drink all the time. Around Christmas and sometime around Easter, they would drink up all of the whiskey that's possible to get into their house and have the cab driver bringing it out there to them when they got to the point to where they couldn't go get it. And some of the neighbors, finally realizing they're in bed and can't do anything about it, would step in and get them to go to the hospital where they would dry them out. But uh, there's that kind of people. Then there's the kind of people drink some every day, and you never know what's going down the road in front of you. And so on and so on. It just, it just covers everything. And we, as members of the church, singing a song like we've just sung, Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, know that he would not in any form or fashion countenance or encourage or teach or authorize the consumption of that which is poison. And that's exactly what it is. It's an intoxicant. Toxic means poison. But I don't expect it to change. You see it everywhere you turn, movies and advertisements, and every way they're doing it, they're trying to say, you can drink a little bit and it won't hurt you. Well, first of all, no one knows that for sure. So what do we want to accomplish in this sermon? Well, I want to say again what we've always said as children of the living God because of what we did in becoming Christians and why we became Christians. We want to do as our Savior authorizes us to act. Colossians 3.17. We want to have the authority of Christ behind our beliefs and behind our actions. This sermon is important because we desire to emphatically impress upon each one listening to it that it is a transgression of God's law. It is sin, 1 John 3, 4, to imbibe alcoholic beverages recreationally like you might drink a soft drink. I wouldn't mind affirming that in a public discussion, but you will never see it affirmed. What bothers me is the myriad of people in the church who say, in fact, who just sang that song, Oh, to be like thee, won't mind taking a drink of something, a little wine before they have their meal or a beer when they get home from work and so on and so forth. Well, I suggest if you can do that, you can take other mind-altering drugs. If you do it responsibly, now what is that? Ephesians 5, 17 through 20, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Ephesus. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning this text, it's obvious that the Christians of the first century were called out of various immoral and evil practices. Just the way that the people ordinary people of the Roman Empire lived. When they heard the gospel, understood it from the heart, believed and obeyed it, they left off 
those evil practices. There truly was in their mind a desire to be like Christ, to live on the spiritual plane that the Word of Christ taught them. One of these practices, as you know, out of which they were called, was the practice of drunkenness through alcohol, and they would even mix alcohol. The Old Testament mentions the mixing of other things to give it a kick even harder than what it normally gave by just being alcohol. And they were called out of that. The gospel call called them out of a life of living on the level of the flesh. And in this passage, Paul's exhorting the brethren at Ephesus not to be drunken with wine or alcohol. I still say that today when we think of being drunken, we're thinking of the guy holding on to the lamppost trying not to fall out. Well, he didn't get that way except that he took the first drink and the second drink and the third drink and each one of them putting his brain to sleep more and more and certainly cutting off his inhibitions. Within this drinking alcohol lies excess. In contrast, they're to be filled with the Spirit. If you want to be full of something, fill your mind with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. And so he says there's the singing and the giving of thanks to God that reflects the Christian's desire to be like Jesus Christ and to live on the spiritual plane. This other pulls you down. Now again, let me haste to say when I say drinking beverage, alcohol, recreation is a sin, I certainly do not have in mind if there's ever a need of the matter of alcohol used in municipal properties. But I think it ought to be dispensed like any other medicine and used in that way. I think some people use it as an excuse to go get a bottle of old snort and keep it under the bed or somewhere. And so they can have a swig before they go to bed every night. <clears throat> well, uh, I've never been for people dispensing such toxic things on their own to themselves or anybody else. So I says, what about the pioneers <clears throat> who back 150, 75 years ago, first of all, they had to know what they knew and they knew very little. And about the only thing they had of any kind of medicine was home brew or something they bought. And even then they would, if they used it for medicinal purposes, not just go around drinking it all the time. Now, that must be understood just like trying to compare wine on the store shelf today with wine as it existed 2,000 years ago. It wasn't measured. You couldn't go read about how much alcohol content was in it, all that kind of thing. So you have to realize the difference in the two and in the very process of it moving from fresh grape juice down to an alcoholic beverage. But that's not that difficult for us today, and anybody trying to figure out ways so they can drink alcoholic beverages recreationally and just simply not being fair with the brain God gave them and using it as they ought to. What does wine mean when used in Bible times? Well, in the Hebrew, there were several words for the grape of the juice, and the same is true in the Greek language. We won't spend our time looking at them. You can go get Vines Expository Dictionary New Testament Word is an easy way to do it. Look those words up. And if you want to go further, you can just uh, get some books that are written specifically about the use of wine in the first century and further back. But wine in the New Testament, the generic term is oinos. You almost hear wine in it. And you can't tell from strictly the word oinos standing by itself whether it means an alcoholic beverage or not. You learn whether it means an alcoholic beverage or not by the literary environment it's found in, the context. Sometimes the word wine refers to intoxicating beverages. 
Going back to the Old Testament, Leviticus 10, 8 through 9, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. You couldn't get plainer than that. And you know, some people thought that that was what was wrong with they'd have it by you. They had broken this law, so they paid very little attention to where they should have got the incense. Well, there's no proof of that, but it certainly would be the way that it works on you. In Isaiah 5, 11, the great prophet, the Messianic prophet, said, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Without joking, that's a whole lot of what's wrong in Washington, D.C., and Austin and a whole lot of other places where those folks gather. But sometimes wine refers to just the juice of the grape. In Matthew 9, 17, Jesus reasoned this way with that, which was very common to those people. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. They recognized the difference in what was fermented and what was not, and even the fermenting process. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now Isaiah 65, 8, Thus the Lord Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. He even speaks of the juice of the grape still in the cluster. And one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. Delivered as a prophecy, of course, against the sins of that country. Jeremiah, in chapter 48, verse 33 and joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. And I have caused wine to fail from the wine presses. None shall tread with shouting. Their shouting shall be no shouting. So that was simply a prophecy of the fall of Judah and Jerusalem and all of the comforts that go with the peaceful time in their culture. So it's a general description of the drink that results from Squeezing grapes. Sometimes I think we laugh about this, but Daddy was stationed in Naples, Italy, and around about there, Foggia and other places of World War II. He said it was not uncommon at all in the time of the grape season. And you can imagine those young men at that time liking to see those girls up in those troughs with their dresses pulled up and tied, and they were tramping out the grapes, and the juice would just be flowing. So some things are not that far removed of us as far as the history is concerned. So there is a new state, non-intoxicating, and there is an age state, and that's intoxicating. But the word wine can refer to either state. And I hear people ignorant of the Bible all the time say, well, we can drink wine, and they mean wine always means alcohol to know the Bible it simply does not now let's go further the Old Testament condemnation of recreational beverage alcohol Proverbs 20 and verse 1 this doesn't take a genius wine is a mocker grape juice is a mocker wine is a mocker strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Does that sound like everybody ought to have some? Everybody ought to get used to it? Everybody ought to drink some? Proverbs 23, 29 through 35, listen to this. And I think all of you have probably heard this or read it yourself. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Think of all those statistics we read a while ago. Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. 
Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. Now, Russia has had for a long, long time a problem with alcoholic drinking. And you can still see it when we were going over there, and I'm sure you can today. But to get up and go to worship services, riding the trolley on Sunday morning, meant that that Saturday night had preceded you. And Saturday night is a bad place anywhere, but especially in a place where they drink all the time. <laughs> and to get on the trolley was quite a sight to behold, as people were trying to get home after putting on an alcoholic binge all night long. People would have cuts on their head, bruised faces. They wouldn't even know it. They couldn't feel it. They were doing, they were doing well to stand there and do this. And this was pitiful, but it was a funny sight. One lady got on one day. I'm generous with the word lady. And she got on the trolley, and she didn't have any money, and she was trying to get a free ride. That's what she was trying to do. And she kept arguing long enough with the bus driver where hopefully she could get to the stop she wanted and get off, not have to pay anything. But she decided she would put on her lipstick. And uh, she was entertainment for the whole bus because it was all over the place. Now imagine, no woman in her right mind would ever be saw, be seen in that way. There she was, right out in front of everybody, because she wasn't in her right mind. It was alcohol polluted. Michael 2, and verse, 11, Michael 2 verse 11, of a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. Now he's saying that. That's what you've been listening to. That's the reason where you are in service to God. That's the reason God's angry at you is that you've been listening to that kind of stuff. It must have been a drunk prophet that's been talking to you. In Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. I sometimes hear people try to justify the Lord turning water into wine and said it must have been alcohol. The Lord kept the law of Moses perfectly. He never violated Habakkuk 2.15. He never gave his neighbor a drink and put, put the bottle to him and made him drunken. Never. The idea of drunkenness and the how well drunk is the way it says means that they just had their fill of it. It doesn't mean they drank and were stupefied, inebriated. People just want to find those things in the Bible in that passage there. Look at the New Testament teaching in Ephesians 5.18. We've already read this, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but filled with the Spirit. Peter had this to say in 1 Peter 4, 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. We used to live like them because we were one of them. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Again, what about Jesus? I've already mentioned him when it came to the matter of the turning of water into wine at the marriage feast of Cana. Proverbs 20 and verse 1, Jesus knew, and he knew that it said that the one who drinks is not wise. The one who prophesies to drink is said in Micah 2.11 to be a false prophet. And the one who gives it to his neighbors, I've already said, is to be under a woe. Habakkuk 2.15 and also Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 11. So it's important for us to recognize that and to be able to see that Jesus did not violate the will of God 
and that he was always consistent with it. The recreational drinking of alcohol destroys mind and body. I need not say, you know this, that scientifically both are destroyed. I would go back and reread even more on that part that I gave you earlier that has nothing to do with uh, Christians writing for the sake of saying, here's how God wants you to live, but it's simply reporting what's going on. I know it's always a horrible and terrible thing when you have shootings in these schools like has been done where you have 20, 30 people killed. It's a terrible thing. Every year for a long, long time, many, many thousands of people are killed in car wrecks alone because of alcohol. Nobody gets disturbed about that at all. We are living in a nation of hypocrites. We focus in on one thing and say that's the most important thing ever on this earth and the worst evil there is and we've got to get rid of it. And yet over here on the other side, people are piled up like they did in the concentration camps in Germany. And everybody just says, well, that's normal. They need to learn to drink responsibly. We as Christians singing songs and meeting it that are in complete harmony with the Bible, oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, need to point those things out to people. I said last week, one of the things wrong with the Lord's church today is that we think we can whip sin with a feather duster. We think we can smile at people and correct their lives. We think we can give them a warm handshake, and that changes their whole life radically. Why, well, don't you know a warm handshake from Stephen would have changed Saul of Tarsus into the peerless apostle Paul? It doesn't work that way, and the Bible makes it clear it doesn't. And when it comes to living godly, the only thing that's going to turn people around like God wants them turned around is for I to show them you're in sin and you're headed for a devil's hell. If people had that in them, they'd do a lot of rectifying of their own lives if they knew by the way I'm living, when I die, I'm lost forevermore in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 Paul said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And look at our own lives, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Anything that would handicap us from doing that is handicapping our faithfulness to God. How can we do this? First, begin with what we've known all along, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What's happening today, even in the church of our Lord, and it's been happening for a great many years. Young people don't have any interest in the church. It's no big deal to them. Just something people go through, maybe for the old folks, and they sit there. And in the back of their minds, they're saying, I get to where I can, I'm going to go all do what I want to. Now, you can't be responsible for all of that, but one thing we can do is show them that Christianity is something you live every day of your life, and it means that you don't do a whole lot of things, and you do a whole lot of things. We just have to know those things, and which is which. Romans 14, 21, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Well, if you can't see what he's saying there, he's saying a godly example or pattern of life does not set itself forth drinking such things as this. So does the recreational drinking of alcohol beverages cause others to stumble? If it doesn't, Romans 14, 21 ought to be cut out of your Bible. There should be no doubt in your mind regarding the issue. Now, based both upon the facts of science and the scriptures themselves, even as we have studied it today, how can we conclude that the recreational consumption of alcohol is anything less than sinful and repugnant to God? 
The Bible forbids it. It destroys the body. It destroys the mind. It sets a very poor example and has a destructive influence. It's that simple. And we shouldn't be moved off of it. And you should be teaching your children about those things. When we sing the little song about don't drink and don't take dope, that's the reason from time to time I try to say, do you know what you're singing? And you'll notice most of those kids... The first time around, they don't know what they mean when you say, don't drink booze. It's just a fun thing to them. Or don't take dope. Mom and daddy, sit them down and tell them the facts of life on those things. Show them what's what. They're going to face it sooner or later, and they need to face it with you while as parents you're teaching them, showing them, and training them. Not when you're not there, and they get to learn it like so many people have about a lot of things at the back of the bus. So, as we bring the lesson to a close, I know it's not the first time such a thing as this has been taught. We haven't discussed it in a while. But if nothing else, it is simply bringing to your remembrance what you've already known. and Seeing that you're circumspect and determined Carry out these things for your children, well, for yourselves first, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbor, anybody around. Show them the truth on this. It's just as important as showing them the plan of salvation and every step in it. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one. And all that the New Testament describes a child of God to be, one who has fully believed in Christ, Romans 10, 17, confessed one's faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32, one who has repented of sins prior to that, Acts 17, 30, and has been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Now, there's no other way to become a Christian. If somebody's told you there's another way, then they must have been a prophet, been drinking something. There is but one other, one way to go. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live the Christian life. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you can lay that behind you in repentance and confession, praying God for forgiveness. Whatever you need along those lines, we invite you to come now while we stand and sing.